Welcome to the Lessons for Living television program. My name is Bill Santos. Thank you so much for watching. It's said that when the famous missionary, Dr. David Livingston, started his trek across Africa, he had with him 73 books in three packs, weighing some 180 pounds. After the party had traveled some 300 miles, Livingston was obliged to throw away some of the books because of the fatigue of those that were carrying his baggage. And as the journey continued, his library grew less and less until he had only one book left, his Bible. You know, before the Reformation, there were at times very few copies of the Bible in existence. But God was not about to allow his word to be entirely destroyed its truths were not to be hidden forever. In different countries of Europe, men were moved by the Spirit of God to search for the truth. And providentially, they were guided to the Holy Scriptures. They studied the Bible. They were willing to accept the light at any cost to themselves. Though they did not see everything clearly, they were enabled to perceive many truths that had for a long time been buried. As heaven-sent messengers, th these reformers, they went forth, breaking the chains of error and of superstition and calling upon those who had been enslaved for so long to arise and to assert their liberty. Except amongst the Waldenses, the word of God had for ages been locked up in languages that were known only to the educated. But the time had come for the scriptures to be translated and given to the people of different lands in their native tongue. In the 14th century in England, the morning star of the Reformation appeared, John Wycliffe. He was the herald of reform, not only for England, but for the entire Christian world. The great protest against Rome, which he uttered, was never about to be silenced. That protest opened the struggle, which was to result in the liberation of individuals, of churches, and even of nations. John Wycliffe was born about the year 1324 during the reign of Edward II. His parents sent him to Queen's College in Oxford. He received there a liberal education, and with that, the fear of the Lord was the beginning of his wisdom. He was recognized at college for his goodness, as well as for his remarkable talents. In his thirst for knowledge, he sought out every branch of learning. He was educated in philosophy, in the canons of the church, and in civil law, especially that of his own country. A thorough understanding of philosophy of his time enabled him to expose its errors, and by his study of national and church law, he was prepared to engage in the great struggle for civil and religious liberty. The power of his genius and the extent and thoroughness of his knowledge commanded respect from both friends and foes. His supporters saw with satisfaction that their champion stood at the front amongst the leading minds of the nation, and his enemies were prevented from casting contempt upon his reforms by exposing his ignorance or his weakness. While Wycliffe was still at college, he came upon the study of the scriptures. In those early years, 
when the Bible existed only in the ancient languages, scholars were permitted to find their way to the fountain of truth, which was closed, well, to those uneducated classes. So the way had been prepared for Wycliffe's future work as a reformer. Many in the educated class had studied the Word of God and had found the great truth of God's free grace. And in the classrooms, they had spread the knowledge of this truth and had led others to also turn to the study of the Bible. When Wycliffe's attention was directed to the study of Scripture, he entered that study with the same thoroughness which had enabled him to become a leading scholar. In the Word of God, he found that that which he had before sought after in vain, here in the Scriptures, he found the plan of salvation revealed and, and, and Jesus Christ set forth as the only advocate for man. He gave himself over to the service of Christ and he determined to proclaim the truths that he had discovered. Like other reformers, Wycliffe did not foresee where his work would lead. He did not set himself deliberately in opposition to Rome, but his devotion to the truth could not but bring conflict into his life because the truth conflicted with the falsehood. The more clearly he recognized the errors of the church, the more earnestly he presented the teachings of the Bible. He realized that Rome had forsaken the word of God for human tradition. He accused the priesthood of having banished the scriptures. He demanded that the Bible be restored to the people and that its authority be again established within the Roman church. He was an able, he was an intense teacher. He was an eloquent preacher. And his daily life, his daily life was a practical demonstration of the truths that he preached. His knowledge of the scripture, his power of reasoning, his, his capabilities, the purity of his life, his unbending courage and his integrity, it won him both respect and confidence. Many of the people that had become dissatisfied with their former faith hailed the truths brought to view by Wycliffe. But the papal leaders... You see, they were filled with rage when they perceived that this reformer was gaining an influence that was even greater than theirs. Wycliffe had a keen ability to uncover error. He argued fearlessly against many of the abuses that had been sanctioned by the authority of Rome. You know, he was chaplain for the king, and, and he, there he took a very bold stand against the payment of the tributes claimed by the pope from the English monarch. And he showed that the papal assumption of authority over secular ru rulers was contrary to both reason and revelation. The demands of the pope had created great fury, and Wycliffe's objections were considered by the leading minds of the nation. The king and the nobles, they came together, and they denied the pontiff's claim to temporal power and refused the payment of the tribute. Well, this was a powerful blow against papal supremacy in England. You see, Wycliffe believed that the Bible was the Word of God, without error, from beginning to end. In fact, once he testified, it is impossible for any part of the Holy Scriptures to be wrong. In Holy Scripture is all the truth. One part of Scripture explains another. Wycliffe's foundational doctrine was that the Bible is the sole authority for faith and practice and that man, well, 
they had the right to interpret scriptures for themselves. He, he said, believers should ascertain for themselves what are the true matters of their faith by having the scriptures in a language which all may understand. As a professor of theology at Oxford, Wycliffe preached the word of God in the halls of the university. So faithfully did he present the truth to his students that he received the title of the gospel doctor. But the greatest work of his life was to be the translation of the scriptures into English. He was motivated to translate the Bible so that every man in England might read it in the language in which he was born. He completed his task and the word of God was opened to England. Wycliffe did not fear prison or burning at the stake. He had placed in the hands of the English people a light that would never be extinguished. In giving the Bible to his countrymen, he had done more to break the shackles of ignorance and to liberate and elevate his country than had ever been achieved by the most brilliant victories on any battlefield. The art of printing was still unknown. Therefore, it was a slow and tiresome job to make copies of the Bible. So great was the interest to see the Bible circulated that many people volunteered to do the transcribing. Demand outnumbered supply, and it was with great difficulty that the copyists could fill the orders. The wealthy, well, they would purchase the whole Bible, while others only a portion. In, in, in many cases, several families would come together and they would purchase a copy of the Bible. In this way, Wycliffe's Bible soon made it into the homes of the people. And the appearance of the scripture brought panic to the authorities of the church. Now, you see, they faced an agency more powerful than Wycliffe, an agency against which their weapons would avail little. There was at this time no law in England prohibiting the Bible because it had never been published in the language of the people. Such laws were enacted later, and later they were rigorously enforced. Meanwhile, notwithstanding the efforts of the church, there was an opportunity for the circulation of the Word of God. The church leaders, well, they plotted to stop Wycliffe. He was summoned before three tribunals, but without avail. Wycliffe would not retract. The charge of heresy which they had brought against him, well, he with convincing power threw back upon his accusers. With whom think you, he finally said, with whom do you think you are contending? With an old man on the brink of the grave? No, with truth truth which is stronger than you and will overcome you. With that, he withdrew from the assembly and not one of his rivals attempted to prevent him. Wycliffe fully expected that his life would be the price for his fidelity. The king, the pope, the bishops, they were united to accomplish his ruin and it seemed that a few months at most would bring him to the stake but his courage was unshaken why do you talk of seeking the crown of martyrdom afar he said preach the gospel of Christ to the haughty prelates and martyrdom will not fail you what should I live and be silent never let the blow fall I await its coming God protected his servant. The man who stood boldly in defense of the truth in daily peril for his life was not to fall victim of the hatred of his foes. Wycliffe had never sought to shield himself 
But the Lord has been, had been his protector. And when his enemies felt sure of their prey, God's hand removed him before their reach. In his church at Lutherwood, he was about to dispense the communion. He fell stricken with palsy. In a short time, he yielded up his life. God had appointed Wycliffe to do this work. He had put the truth in his mouth. He had set a guard about him that his word might come to the people. His life was protected. His labors were prolonged until a foundation was laid for the great work of the Reformation. Wycliffe came from the obscurity of the Dark Ages. There were none who went before him from whose work he could shape his system of reform. He was raised up like John the Baptist to accomplish a very special mission. He was the herald of a new era. Wycliffe was one of the greatest reformers in intellect, in clearness of thought, in firmness to maintain the truth, and in his boldness to defend it, he was equaled by few who came after him. The church had failed to stop Wycliffe during his life. And their hatred could not be satisfied while his body rested quietly in the grave. By the decree of the Council of Constance, more than 40 years after his death, his bones were exhumed and publicly burned. And his ashes were thrown into a neighboring brook. But it was through the writings of Wycliffe that John Huss of Bohemia was led to renounce many of the errors of the church and also enter upon the work of reform. From Bohemia, the work extended to other lands. The minds of men were directed to the long-forgotten word of God. A divine hand was preparing the way for the great reformation. The character of Wycliffe is a testimony to the educating and the transforming power of the scriptures. It was the Bible that made Wycliffe what he was. The study of the Bible will refine every thought, every feeling, every aspiration. It gives firmness to our purpose. It gives us patience and courage and strength. It refines the character. It sanctifies the soul. The 119th Psalm in verse 130, we read, The unfolding of your words give light. It gives understanding to the simple. You know, the Bible, this is a book that is owned by more people in North America than any other single book. But far too many people, including Christians, have the Bible in their homes, but not in their hearts. And that's a tragedy. I'm holding here in my hand, not only a book of miracles, but a miracle book. Do you know that the Bible's name actually means book of books? It's not only one book. It's 66 books in one. 66 love letters from God to you and to me. The diversity is amazing. These 66 books were written by 40 different authors living on several different continents in the nations of Palestine, Babylon, Greece, Rome, Asia Minor, and perhaps Arabia. They wrote in three different languages, Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic. They were separated in time by some 16 centuries, but yet the Bible tells the same story from the beginning right to the end. See, the Bible wasn't written for information. It was written for transformation. Here's how that happens. When the child of God reads the word of God, and sees the Son of God, he is transformed by the Spirit of God into the image of God for the glory of God. The purpose of the Bible and to study the Bible is not to brag, it's not to argue, it's not to debate about what we know. The purpose of Bible study 
is to live righteous, godly lives. It's a tragedy to hold such a transforming book in our hands, but never take its power into our hearts. You know, I heard the story of a man who owned a vineyard. His sons believed his father to be a very wealthy man. But since he was so secretive about his wealth, they couldn't be sure. They were hoping they would inherit his fortune when he died. Well, on his deathbed, he told his sons the secret of his wealth was to be found in the vineyard. Well, after he died, the boys went out to that vineyard immediately and they began to dig, hoping to find the treasure they believed to be hidden there under the vines. They toiled for months, being careful not to damage the vines. They dug over every inch of that vineyard. They pulled out every weed. They cleaned off all the grass, but they discovered nothing. But that fall, the vineyard produced the finest crop of grapes in the history of that family. Then they realized what that wise old father had done. He had forced them to stop moping around and waiting for the money to come. And instead, he tricked them into cultivating the vineyard. The secret of his wealth was the vines, which, when properly cared for, would make them very rich. You see, we too have a vineyard that will produce unbelievable spiritual wealth to us but we have to work at it. We have to dig through it. We have to get into it. That's why we ought to study the Bible. It'll change you. It'll change you from the inside out. It will change you from the outside in. It will help you be all that God wants you to be. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that in your love and kindness you sent Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have provided for us your written manuscript, these 66 love letters that express to each and every one of us just how much you love us. I pray that you be with every viewer, particularly those right now that are committing to a study of the Bible, and in it they will find the secret to life everlasting. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we've come to the end of the program. Uh, first, let me thank you uh, for tuning in. We appreciate uh, you joining us each and every week. Uh, I want to ask you to, if you can help us in getting the word out about the program and let your friends, let your family know when we are on. Uh, to help you with that, we have some resources. Uh, we have our website, l4ltv.com. Uh, right on the front page of the website, you'll see the upcoming program, where we're on, the times we're on. Uh, you have under the previous programs tab, all of the previous programs since we first began airing. And you can use that to share that with your friend. You can refer your friends there and they can watch all of those programs. There's also a tab that says uh, live appearances. That'll show you where I will be. Most weeks I'm at my church in Toronto, but sometimes I'm traveling. So just go to the live appearances and see where I'll be. And why not come out and join me and introduce yourself to me at one of my live uh, appearances. There's also a tab there that says donate today. And if you can make a donation, and many of you have, and we truly appreciate that, uh, knowing that when you make a donation to this ministry, all of the money donated remains with the ministry. In other words, it doesn't come to me for salary. It doesn't come to me for wardrobe. It is used to pay for the studio that we're in, the crew that we have, the airtime, the gifts that we give out. Not a penny of that comes to me in terms of wages or anything personally for me. That uh, I pastor a church and my salary comes from there. And so you know that every dollar you invest is being invested directly into the ministry to the, for the proclamation uh, of the good news. Now, also on the website, you can be, join a study group if you want. 
If you want to get into Bible study, there's a bunch of ways you can do it. I can, I can hook you up with a study group in your community. You can study online. You can study with a, a private instructor. I can send you Bible studies by correspondence. Uh, any way you want. Our, our goal is to get you studying the scripture. The means by which it's going to happen, well, that's not going to be an obstacle because we'll figure it out. So if that's something you're interested in, email me, bill at l4ltv.com, and we'll get that set up for you. Also, follow me on Instagram, at Santos underscore Bill. And every day I put out a one-minute devotional on Instagram. And, and many of you have said, you know, that's how you start your day. You start off the day, you watch that one-minute devotional, and just sort of kickstart your day. If you'd like to do that, Santos at, uh, at Santos underscore Bill on Instagram. MissionNowCanada.com. Remember that website, MissionNowCanada.com. Now, Mission Now Canada is a branch of our ministry that does overseas mission work. And so we go into the Philippines and to South America, and we provide free dental care, free medical care. We always have a building project, a great experience. You can find out more about that and maybe want to join us on one of our trips, missionnowcanada.com. I am all out of time. I have to go. God bless you. Thank you so much for being here. Let's do this again real soon.